this is Pacific Media from the Pacific Coast of Canada. All candidates sincerely offer to change the political system. But to do that, they really want your endorsement of political power to them so they can make all the political decisions for you and me. We the citizens have to ask ourselves, are we really incapable of legislating our own policies? If that is our belief, then we will continue to give our political power to legislate to political representatives. On the other hand, if we realize that we the citizens can legislate our own rules of governance, we will start building a direct democracy system. This is uh, Professor James Lassum from UBIC, uh, Department of Political Science. And uh, you've been researching on democracy. You do some research on democracy in general. And uh, my question is, how democratic is our political system in the province of British Columbia, which resides, first of all, maybe symbolically, maybe more than symbolically, on a monarchy? Right. Um, I think this, uh, this aspect of our constitution sometimes puzzles people. Uh, and um, it becomes puzzling all the more, not just for people who are Republicans uh, out of conviction, but also from people who um, don't have as part of their growing up any positive memories of uh, the British constitutional history. Mm -hmm. So the, the usual defense that you'll get of how our system works under a monarch uh, is that the queen is queen under sufferance from us. I don't understand that. Under, uh, under sufferance means she's queen as long as we want her to be queen. And uh, even as early as the, uh, the, there was something called the Glorious Revolution in 1688 in England, mm -hmm. uh, the English Bill of Rights is imposed on the king and queen, the new king and queen, and they're told they can govern as long as they respect uh, these rights. And so the argument from inside this system mm -hmm is that we respect the queen not just because she's queen, but because her predecessors mm -hmm. agreed to growing liberties on the part of her subjects. So we don't have the kind of top-down kind of monarchy that the czars had or mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. And the only, uh, the only thing we're asked to remember is that at least within England, the queen conceded powers mm -hmm. or the kings before her. Mm -hmm. uh, and so now we're, we're acknowledged by acknowledging her, the story is we're also acknowledging that she has very little power and we're really driving mm -hmm. policy. So that's the, that's the positive story. Mm -hmm. What's the negative? Well, the negative story, I think, is uh, um, twofold. If you're sitting in England, you're very much aware that the monarchy is a real head of a real class system. Mm -hmm. And they really do own property and take rents from people simply because they're the monarchs. Mm -hmm. um, so in England, the problems much more in your face. For us, it's about how our historical memories work. If you're sitting in Quebec, you remember completely different things about what the monarchy means. Or if your family, say, was from the Caribbean or from uh, India or Pakistan, you remember very important things about the monarchy that aren't anything that good. Or if you're native from Canada. Uh, well, that's an interesting story in itself, and I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't deny what you're saying, 
But at the same time, uh, there are some people in uh, indigenous communities in this country who will say, our relationship was with the crown, it's the settlers that gave us trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, the treaties so, were signed with the Queen. That's my understanding, mm -hmm. and I, I wouldn't want to speak for the First Nations and their members, but uh, I think it's a complicated relationship mm -hmm. that many of them feel. Mm -hmm. um, so those are all, you know, historical memories. Our reality in the system we've inherited mm -hmm. is that power has to flow through the prime ministers and premiers and through their cabinets. The type of democracy we have here, we say it's uh, influence by corporate financing. Oh, yes. Specifically on elections. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what, what do you think about it? What your research says about this influence that we have uh, on financing? Right. Well, there are ways of shifting the balance of power uh, between the broad base of the population and centers of power and influence like corporations. Uh, it's possible to have campaign finance laws that are weak, uh, that allow uh, the dollars to talk more than the votes, and it's possible to have rules that are pretty strict Quebec's one of the better provinces in this country in terms of restricting the role of money. But if we roll the camera back a bit into the 18th and 19th centuries, we have to remember that the whole foundations of our democracy start from the standpoint that the state doesn't get inter to interfere in certain parts of our lives. And one of the parts that was accepted from the get-go uh, was the distribution of private property that generates the class differences in a society. And because we started from those premises, we have to work really hard to offset the influence of, you know, the power imbalances that go with money. Yeah. So our democracy in a way is faulty because we're given too much uh, in, too much power and to and the influence of uh, financing campaigns well well the, from the financing uh, campaigns and all the other kinds of influence mm -hmm. uh, that flow from corporate power in our society mm -hmm. that's that's a key argument of some pretty important Canadians uh, in political science and one of them is C.B. McPherson, uh, who uh, I'm sort of quoting here mm -hmm. in the answer I'm giving right now. Mm -hmm. And what, what did he say? He said, Well, it, he was saying that this arrangement that we have mm -hmm. uh, that uh, says that the state can't enter into certain areas of our life was arranged in many Western countries mm -hmm. so that the areas that the state can't get involved with include the, the markets, the private property of productive equipment, and so on. So that is a fly in our system? Uh, well, it sure is if you think that money influences politics. Mm -hmm. Coming at uh, ministers, which are selected by the premier, yeah. so the premier becomes some, more or less like a king or a queen. And uh, yeah. they, they have the power, a lot of MLAs that go to parliament, they just follow the whip's direction and uh, they don't have power to, to do much. Right. Whereas the premier has this centralized authority. Is that a fly in our democracy? <laughs> uh, well, yes, this is a huge debate in uh, uh, circles uh, that discuss political science. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one name in particular is a, a gentleman from uh, the East Coast. Uh, his name's Donald Savoie, uh, and he works out of Moncton. Uh, his argument is exactly that the prime minister and the premiers have become like little monarchs, mm -hmm. that even the cabinet is being cut out of key decision making, mm -hmm. and it's the unelected advisors around the premier and around the prime minister uh, who are um, disciplining not just the rest of us, not just 
parliament, but even their own cabinet colleagues. Uh, and that is a very serious problem uh, for even a, a plurality of discussion within a given governing party. The Premier has the authority to open and close mm. parliament sessions. Yes. And if she doesn't want to, she doesn't have to open it, like recently, mm. right? So, well, the next meeting will be in January. Mm. <laughs> and legally, she has that right. Right. Uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to, to, the, to believe that we're in a demo democracy, mm. some kind of democracy. But mm. Well, well this, is, uh, this is an interesting question. And again, you've got a basic set of issues about how the foundations are set up and there are rules that can make that problem bigger or smaller. Mm -hmm. So other countries that have our basic parliamentary system mm -hmm. have developed what are called cab cabinet manuals mm -hmm. that lay down rules mm -hmm. about how often parliament has to meet, mm -hmm. uh, that lay down when parliament can be prorogued, mm -hmm. uh, and some other things that are uh, powers between the monarchy, the, the governor general, the lieutenant governor, and the premier or prime minister. Um, so that's, uh, there, there are ways of reducing that power. Mm -hmm. And I'll also say that, uh, you know, there, there is some technical grounds for the prime minister having some say, because the government does have to start up the discussion. They have to have something to bring to Parliament. So the, the traditional justification is they're the ones who know when they're ready to bring things to Parliament, they get to determine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's pretty debatable yeah, yeah, these days. Thinking, what makes them the only ones uh, that mm. monopolize that authority? Right. We, All the M MLAs could, could do that. Yes. They could have a list of uh, priorities and say um, the first 10 we're going to mm. discuss and this weekend, the second 10 next week. So technically we don't really need the, the premier to, uh, to uh, program what was going to be more, more important. They, there are two areas where there's some control or potential control. Uh, one is that we do have a constitutional requirement that Parliament or the legislature, like both levels, mm -hmm. have to meet at least once a year, right? Mm -hmm. So it can't be indefinite. Yeah, sounds... <laughs> um, uh, the second thing is to have uh, people agree to some principles about how quickly Parliament has to come back after um, an election has happened or a major break in the parliamentary session has happened. Mm -hmm. um, and that requires some multi-partisan agreement mm -hmm. and no bipartisan agreement or multi-partisan agreement is going to happen without a lot of pressure from below from people like you and me.